Ezra Nehemiah, let us rise up and build. This is lesson five in this series. Building without fear or compromise, part two. So in our last lesson, uh, we looked at the uh, various stages that the Jews went through as they returned from captivity and began the process of rebuilding. Uh, briefly, just to uh, refresh our minds, the uh, first couple of stages. Stage one was actually the beginning. You read about that in uh, Ezra chapter three, verses uh, one to 13. And uh, as we read this, we find out that uh, despite the hostile surroundings, uh, the people begin to build in the proper order. And the first thing that they begin on is not their houses or not the you know, stores or anything. They begin uh, with God's house first. Uh, God was the one who uh, you know, permitted them to return according to uh, Jeremiah's prophecy of uh, the 70 year exile. Jeremiah 25, nine to 13. And so uh, when they get back, the first thing that they uh, begin rebuilding is the altar, the altar of sacrifice. The altar was not inside the, the, the temple building, it was in the courtyard. And so they rebuilt the altar of sacrifice without which the priests could not offer sacrifice. And the offering of sacrifice was central to the uh, Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish religion. There were a lot of things that they had to do, in, you know, building up the actual building itself. You know, there are lots to do. However, building the altar first uh, was the priority. Stage number two is the opposition. We mentioned that anytime you start something, it really, you start off great, but there's always obstacles, problems, you know, and of course, in this case, they had ob uh, opposition. Their return was noticed by the neighbors the neighboring uh, people. But when the work of restoring the worship of the temple was known by these people, by the neighbors, the Samaritans, who were also Jews who had been carried off by the Assyrian nation, and uh, they had been assimilated by various uh, pagan nations. But these people also had wandered back to their farmlands in Northern Israel uh, but the difference is they brought with them their uh, pagan gods, uh, pagan worship, pagan lifestyle. Remember I told you last week, the Jews, the, the uh, positive thing, the good thing about them was they were able to uh, uh, maintain their identity, maintain their cu cultural purity, maintain their worship and so on and so forth while they were in exile. Whereas the, uh, the people of the Northern tribes who were carried off by Assyria, they were just assimilated all over the place, you know, and because of that, uh, they, um, they um, took on the lifestyle of the pagan nations where they were sent. Um, so seeing the temple and its worship restored, the Northern people wanted to participate as, you know, they were long lost kin. And they figured, you know, they had the right uh, to uh, participate with them. Of course, uh, pagan worship uh, was pantheistic. In other words, you worshiped many gods. This was their habit. Uh, you worshiped your own personal gods, your household gods. And then there were the gods of your land. Uh, each city had their version of the Baal God. You know, you often hear about Baal worship. Every city had a different Baal God, you know, suited to that particular uh, city. And then on top of that, you had powerful gods found only in your region. Such was the God of the temple of the Jews in Jerusalem from the mindset of the Northern people now. They're seeing, wow, we got our household gods, we've got our Baal gods, but this other God who was really powerful back in the day is, is being brought back and they wanted in on that, you know, on that worship. So the Samaritans wanted to help and of course, infiltrate through marriage and the mixing of religion. Uh, this would give them access to the powerful God of the uh, temple of the Jews. That was the, uh, that was the purpose. Of course, the Jews in the South, those that had come back from Babylonian captivity, the Jews, they refused the help and the participation, knowing that this is exactly what led to the destruction of the temple and their exile in the first place. 
the mixing of people, the mixing of religion, the, the, the adapting of a, you know, pagan religion in addition to their own religion. That's what got them in trouble and got them destroyed and you know, off into exile for 70 years. This time they learned their lesson. This time they said, nope, not even going to go there, you know, as we would uh, say today. And so sensing the revival of a personal deity as a future threat, the people of the north opposed the building of the temple. You know, if we can't join them, then we're going to try to destroy it before it ever gets built. And they do it you know, with psychological uh, warfare, if you wish, political and uh, military threats. So uh, we've gone over this in detail. I'm just going over the stages here. So stage two was the opposition from the surrounding uh, nation. Stage three was renewal. We read in uh, Ezekiel, uh, excuse me, not Ezekiel, but Ezra, chapter five, verses one to 17. Here God's prophets help the people to stand firm in their work and their commitment to, to build. The Jews learn the difference between uh, a knockdown and a knockout, you know, which I explained last week. They were going, you know, from time to time they would stumble. From time to time they would, you know, get knocked down. Uh, but they kept getting up. The prophets kept encouraging them not to quit, to stay at it. They also realized that what God has sent them to do is worth fighting for. And so in today's lesson, we're going to review stages four and five in the Jewish effort to rebuild the temple, uh, their nation, their lives as the chosen people of God. So stage number four. Stage number four is completion. Completion. You read about that in Ezra chapter six, verses one to 22. And as I've mentioned, just in case you're kind of new to this, as I've mentioned, we don't have time to read all these passages. I've encouraged you, go ahead and read the Ezra and Nehemiah, they're not very long. Go ahead and read those books uh, on your own so that when you get here, you'll be able to follow along what I'm, uh, you know, what I'm talking about. So in Ezra, uh, chapter six, verses one to 22, you get the completion uh, stage. Uh, his account details the tremendous turn of events that occurred once the people put their faith in God, once they decided to put their faith in God, things uh, began to change. First, the king finds the original decree granting permission for the rebuilding of the temple during the reign of Cyrus. That was very important because the surrounding nations had said, they have no right to build. Who told them to build? Nobody gave them permission to build and they lobbied the king, you know. So when they found the original decree that said they had the right to build, that the king had actually you know, sent them to rebuild the temple, that gave them the courage to go on. The second thing, the present king, Darius, rescinds his orders and he permits the building to go forward. Then the king also instructs that the money for the rebuilding is to come from the taxes paid by the people of that region. That was particularly galling uh, for the uh, nations uh, uh, around them because it meant that the enemies of the Jews are now going to be underwriting the rebuilding of the temple with their tax money. So that, that was a reversal of fortune for the, for the enemies. Next, the king adds a uh, proviso to the decree which imposes the death penalty on anyone interfering with the work or opposing uh, his law in verse 11. And of course, this guaranteed the safety of those who were working on the project. They worked on the project, but they were always afraid that there were going to be attacks. Someone would come in and destroy what they did. Now they have the protection of the king, uh, 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 you know, written into a law. And then finally, Darius praises and permits the worship of the God of the Jews. This was important because it legitimized the Jewish religion in the empire and it protected its uh, practice. No one could interfere with the practice of the Jewish religion because it was now acceptable according to law uh, in order to uh, worship, uh, uh, to have Jewish worship uh, in the kingdom. Next, we read about Ezra. Ezra says that the work on the temple was completed in the sixth year of Darius's reign. That's about 20 years after it began. Most of that 20 years, it sat idle. 
It wasn't that they worked on it for 20 years, is they started and then they stopped for almost 20 years and then they started over again. And the project wasn't completed, however, until the temple began to function as the central place for worship. The idea was, it's one thing to build the building, but I mean, uh, there was more to it than just having the building and the implements. They had to have the priests and the Levites and all the people, all the system of Jewish worship, which was very uh, complex. If you've been in the Leviticus class, you know how much, uh, how many rules there were, how all the minutia of presenting a sacrifice in the proper way according to the law. So all of that hadn't yet been installed. Um, in uh, verses 16 to 22, we see the people gathering animals for sacrifice, organizing the priests and the Levites for their service, and celebrating the feast of the Passover. The people are full of joy and thanksgiving as they acknowledge how God has not only worked in their lives, but in the lives of the powerful kings and officials to bring about this day, which would not have happened without the uh, input of the king. So you have a pagan king uh, who authorizes the rebuilding of the temple and uh, embeds this worship into the law of the land. Uh, you know, nothing short of a miracle as far as Jews are concerned. Now for a time, uh, the nation enjoys what we call you know, a mountaintop experience, mountaintop experience because they've achieved the completion of their project. But this is not necessarily the end of the process. You and I know that life, especially life in God's kingdom, doesn't work like that. You know, you, you, we all have mountaintop experiences, you know, as a group, as a church, as individuals, as families, mountaintop experiences. But what, what, what happens when you're on the mountaintop? Do you always stay there? No, you don't stay on the mountaintop. It's a, usually a pretty short uh, experience. So let's, let's review you know, just the, the five stages now. The beginning, when I call, when I, the reason I call the five stages, this, this fits for anything. Anything you want to do in the church, anything you want to do in the name of the Lord, you know, usually you know, follows this pattern. There's the beginning, oh, you see the end, you see the glorious thing that you want to do. Uh, there's the opposition, trouble, obstacles, all kinds of things get in your way. Uh, there's renewal, usually you kind of renew and you get back into it. The completion of the, um, uh, the, completion of the, um, the project, and then maintenance, is very anticlimactic. Maintenance, uh, we go to Nehemiah for maintenance. The word maintenance doesn't sound very noble, very spiritual or lofty, especially as a last point in Almighty God's process, but I couldn't find a better word to describe what happens after the completion. You complete it and then there's maintenance. Once you've created and built and birthed and purchased something, you have to maintain it. It's as simple as that. You buy a car, you have that mountaintop experience, you know, you drive the truck off the lot, you know, wow, it's terrific, you know, automatic everything. You know, I remember when I had just got a, a car and I, I realized that the, uh, at night the, um, the lights, you know, they, they dim and then they, they, the, the, the high beams come on automatically, you know, if, there's, if it's too dark and then they, they lower automatically if there's another car coming or if there's more light. It's amazing, you don't know, have to kind of, well, back in the day you'd have to, you, there was a button on the floor that you hit with your foot, if you remember, <laughs> right? But you know what I'm saying, you're fumbling around to get the, the brights going and you hit your windshield wiper instead of the, the, the bright thing. You know? So to have the car do that all by itself, you know, wow, that's, that's, that's fantastic, you know? Just a mountaintop, well, you know, you get to a point in life that that's a mountaintop experience. <laughs> But the mountaintop experience always followed by maintenance, right? Because I realized the car is pretty dirty. I had to go have it washed. So I had it washed, put it in the, guitar, in, the, in, the, in the garage for three days. And then when I took it out this morning, it's raining. So there's maintenance. There's always maintenance. Well, even in your spiritual life, there's, there's maintenance. This is true because in this fallen world, sinful world, things, whether they be temples or religious uh, uh, people, uh, they deteriorate and so they need to be maintained. We see this phenomenon work in the story of the rebuilding of the temple and the restoring of worship in Jerusalem. 
the people did complete the task and they rejoiced on the mountaintop for a while, but it soon became evident that their temple and their faith would require serious maintenance. The maintenance part of the process is described in Nehemiah in the 13th chapter of his book. Once the temple was rebuilt and worship began there, uh, there remained one task and that was the rebuilding of the protective wall around the city. And so Nehemiah, they call him a cup bearer, you know, bringing the wine to the king, actually was a counselor, he was a counselor of sorts to the king, to the court. This man is sent by God to do this work, you know, to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And he follows the very same process that Zerubbabel and others had experienced with the rebuilding of the temple. First enthusiastic beginning as God works in the heart of the king to allow Nehemiah to go back to his home country to rebuild the wall. Secondly, there was opposition from enemies who threatened them, same thing that happened. Thirdly, there was renewal as Nehemiah rallied the people to get in there and to work. And then there was the completion of the wall with the ensuing parade and you know, they walked on the top of the wall and they met in the middle and they celebrated and they you know, blessed the, the day. So Nehemiah, after the wall was completed, he returns to Babylon to take up his former position. The king didn't free him to leave. He said, you can go do this project, but you need to come back, come back to Babylon to his job if you wish. Uh, but a little later on, uh, Nehemiah hears that things have begun to deteriorate in Jerusalem. And this is where the maintenance part of the process kicked in as far as Nehemiah was concerned. In Nehemiah chapter 13, we get a glimpse of what was going on. First, one of the priests permitted one of his pagan relatives to use the storeroom or a storeroom in the temple as a personal residence. When they say storeroom, you know, we're thinking closet, you know, like where you put your storeroom was a very, very large, uh, a very large area uh, if someone could set up their, uh, you know, their living quarters there. Um, of course, that a pagan, imagine now, that a pagan actually lived in the temple courtyards or in the temple court, defiled the entire temple itself. That was unheard of. I mean, if a, in the days of Jesus, if a Gentile wandered into the wrong courtyard, they would be killed. So you can imagine somebody living, a pagan living in the temple area. That was, that was horrendous, that was terrible. So that was one of the things that he heard that was going on. Secondly, the people stopped providing support, financial support for the work of the ministry of the temple. And as a result, the Levites who were there to take care of temple affairs no longer served at the temple. And they returned to their homes and to their farms. They got to eat. They got to eat. You know, you pay preachers. Why? Well, a loaf of bread costs the same thing for the preacher as it does for the members. So uh, same thing. The Le Levites weren't getting paid, so they just went home. Uh, a next uh, event that uh, took place, uh, low attendance. Yeah, can't you see the trend? Uh, moral standards begin to drop. People who are responsible for the work and the people of the temple uh, they're not getting paid, so they go home. And then low attendance, a lack of presence at the temple produced a lack of commitment in keeping the Sabbath. People worked on the Sabbath. There was buying and selling in the temple area, even on the Sabbath day, because there were no Levites to guard the gates. The Levites were the guardians of the gates, among other things made sure that the gates were closed for Sabbath so nobody could come in, uh, made sure that things were operating properly within the temple uh, area. So if the, if, the, if the Levites are gone, anything goes. Nobody's paying attention. Nobody's minding the store as we say uh, today. And then even the priests who were charged with leadership began to violate the law themselves by marrying foreign wives. This was a dangerous first step 
back into the idolatry which caused their exile in the first place. One thing for uh, one of the people to marry a foreign wife, that was a problem, that was one thing, but for the priests to do that, the ones who were leading, the ones who were supposed to give the example, the ones who were supposed to enforce the rules and the laws for them to break the law. I mean, there's nothing stopping the people uh, at this point from going uh, headlong into uh, paganism. So it's a cardinal rule of human nature played out over and over again in the Bible. People learn, people grow, people forget, people regress. The same old, same old. Had a young preacher back in Montreal uh, working with me and I was training him and one day he came into my office and he, he threw himself into the chair, slammed the door, threw himself into the chair, you know, I said, Roger, what's, What's wrong? You know, what's, what's, what happened? You know, I'm fed up. Really, you're fed up? Yeah, I'm fed up. Of course, uh, he was speaking in French, but that's what he said, I'm fed up. Well, you know, what, what, what's happened to make you feel this way? Well, you know, he was working with brother so-and-so. Brother so-and-so had a, a drinking problem, you know, and he was working with him, praying often, studying the Bible with him, and he discovered that brother so-and-so had gone back to drinking. And so he was fed up. And I said, wait a minute, let me get this straight here. You're a, you're a preacher, right? Yes. I said, you're fed up with sin? <laughs> yeah, I guess, that's it, I'm fed up with sin. I said, buddy, you're gonna be out of work. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that keeps us in business is sin. <laughs> we preach the gospel to people to, for forgiveness of sin and we encourage them to avoid sin and we pray with them when they struggle with sin and we remind them that God is gracious because men are weak and sinful. I mean, but see, you take sin out of the equation, you're fed up with sin. I mean, you've got nothing to do. You might as well go back to doing what you were doing before. So it's the same thing here. You know, the human nature is exactly the same thing. Nehemiah knew this. And so he returned in order to do maintenance work on God's people. Nothing wrong with the building, the building was fine. It's the people that needed the maintenance. Many times in the church today, it's not the building so much that needs the maintenance, although we do have to take care of it. It's the people that need the, uh, the maintenance. So what did he do uh, when he goes back? First, he removes the intruder from the temple and restores the purity of the temple. He reinstates the offerings to support the temple and its workers, gets the people to begin again, their tithing and their giving. Uh, he assigns the Levites to keep stricter controls in order to enforce Sabbath regulations. If they don't close the doors, then people take advantage of that situation and they'll be buying and selling inside the, the temple. So the Levites had to manage that properly. And he rebuked the priests for their actions and made them swear not to give their children in marriage to foreigners. He had reaffirmed that dangerous idea that God had warned them against. So God's process always includes maintenance, always for the temple or for the church. There's always maintenance work to do. In every generation, there are those who are tasked with maintaining the work and the people of, of God. In the Old Testament, the job usually fell to the prophets. Not, not, not the priests, the prophets are the ones that did the maintenance. The prophets are the ones that rose up, that God rose up the prophets to speak to the people, to speak to the leaders, to speak to the kings, to speak to the priests and the Levites, to speak to all of them. The prophets are the ones that brought the message of God saying to them, what you're doing is not right or be careful, or there's a, you know, there's a destruction that's coming and so on and so forth. That was their, uh, that was their uh, role. Uh, in the New Testament, God uses uh, elders at times uh, to uh, rebuke or encourage or uh, uh, you know, to uh, call out uh, sinfulness in the church. Usually evangelists uh, to admonish and encourage and rebuke the church in order to maintain uh, the proper functioning of the church in the, in the proper way. It's not always nice. It's, it's good to hear a sermon that is encouraging, that reminds us that God is uh, merciful. Absolutely. Uh, 
we, no matter how old we are in Christ, we sometimes begin to doubt our own worthiness uh, before God. We begin to doubt, you know, am I really saved? Am I really, how can, does he really love me? Because man, I'm having trouble loving myself. I'm just not liking myself because I'm, I know me and I, I, I know what I could do and I know what I should do and I'm not doing it. And I, it's just, you know, who encourages you when you feel like that? Will you get encouragement at the job? A tinker, is one of the guys at Tinker gonna draw you aside, you know, at the office, on the line, at the school? No. No, it's a brother, it's a sister. Many times it's the preacher in one of his classes or in a sermon, or perhaps if you have a personal Bible study, he's the one charged with maintaining your faith, with encouraging you uh, in your faith. And sometimes, and we don't like it, admonishing you and me, I'm also part of the church, uh, admonishing us uh, for, the, for things that we are doing or warning us not to do other things that we may do or fall into. Uh, that's the task of, of, the, uh, uh, of the leaders of the uh, congregation. Uh, don't, um, don't fight back when that uh, takes place. If, if, if one of the elders gives a warning, uh, think about that. T take it uh, seriously because they're responsible for our souls. A very important concept. Well, we see this uh, with Nehemiah. He goes back and he, you know, he does maintenance work uh, to put them back on the, on the road to, um, to worshiping God properly. So I've tried to show you that in serving the Lord, especially when you rise up to build something, whether it be a church or a relationship or a new ministry or a new life, there's usually a process. There's a beginning, there's always opposition, there's a renewal, you finally get to completion, you, you reach your goal, but then there's all important maintenance work that has to be, has to be done. Wouldn't it be nice, uh, ladies, uh, once you gave birth, all the work was done? <laughs> you know, wouldn't it be nice, that final push, you go ahead, push, you know, and, uh, and that's it. You know, they said, hi mom, thanks so much, very nice. I'm off to live my life now. I appreciate all that pushing you did, you know, but it doesn't work like that, doesn't it? You have that high moment, oh my goodness, a new life. Look at little Johnny, little Betty, whatever, you know. But uh, that high point there uh, is wonderful. You never loved your baby or your spouse so much as you love them at that very moment. You know, I love you so much, you know. I remember saying, if I ever do anything to hurt you, God should just smack me one. You know what I mean? Uh, when, I, when I saw the babies that Lise uh, gave, uh, gave us, you know. Uh, but there's maintenance work. They have to learn how to eat. They have to learn to go to the bathroom. They have to do this, they, you know. And then, and then they're 25 years old. Is there any maintenance work when they get to be 25? Of course there is. Of course there is. What new parents don't realize is they've just embarked on a, <laughs> a lifetime of work, a lifetime process that doesn't end. You think it ends when they move out? <laughs> no, it doesn't, it doesn't end when they move out. Uh, just another phase begins. So it's the same thing, I'm trying to tell you, it's the same thing spiritually, that's all. It's always the same thing as spiritually. It helps when you know what type uh, or what stage you're in when things begin to happen to you spiritually. Another thing about the process is that it's not necessarily a straight line from beginning to maintenance. Sometimes opposition forces you back to begin all over again. Sometimes renewal is followed by several periods of opposition before completion takes place. It's not all neat and clean. Finally, try to remember some of the lessons taught by the process experienced by Ezra and Nehemiah and the people who rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. A couple of lessons here that we, uh, that we learned from this. First lesson, you don't usually meet opposition until you disturb or threaten the status quo. Everything was fine in Jerusalem, that city that had been trashed you know, by the Babylonians. Everything was fine until somebody decided to rebuild the temple. 
Somebody disturbed the status quo. That's when the trouble happens. Well, you know when trouble happens in our spiritual life? Well, I, you know what? Uh, I, I, I picked my old reliable, you know, my old reliable example, you know. Uh, today I decide I'm gonna quit smoking. I've been smoking off and on, you know, you know, but that's just a habit, I gotta let go, you know, it's not, it's not consistent with being a Christian, it's a nasty habit, it's, not, it's unhealthy, there's nothing good about it, you know, blah, blah. I'm gonna let that go. And, and you know what happens the minute you say, I'm gonna let that go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grow beyond this, you know what happens, eh? Yeah, Satan says, oh, look at that guy, he thinks he's good, you know. And the roof caves in. I remember when I left Montreal many, many years ago, I just you know, sold my car, bought a one-way ticket to Vancouver, I was taking the train, trying to figure out stuff. I wasn't a Christian, uh, but I bought a Bible in the, in, the, in the train station. I bought a Bible, I figured, oh, I can, I can knock this off between now and Vancouver. You know, I left the drugs behind, I left everything behind, you know. I left the, you know, I don't know how many thousands of dollars worth of drugs, just, no, no more of that. I'm on the train. The first day on the train, the first day on the train, a guy sits next to me, he says, hey, you wanna smoke up? <laughs> first day on the train. It's like that for anything you wanna do. You wanna lose weight? Same thing. Wanna go back to the gym? Same thing. You wanna start, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm off and on uh, going on Wednesday nights church. I, I, I believe I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make time for it. You know, uh, a thousand things happen to not permit you to go Wednesday, so whenever, whenever the time is. So uh, unbelievers uh, don't like it when God's people decide to, to do something. So that's the first lesson, starting something always causes opposition. Sometimes the opposite, you know, you say to your body, I'm going to get better control of you. And your body says, over my dead body you are. <laughs> right, that's the way it works. Lesson number two, your enemies won't always play fair. For example, bad things happen to people who are trying to do good. Or people will use your past mistakes to accuse you in the present. Whoa, Mr. Holiness over here, quit smoking, no, oh, good for, you know what I mean, you get that attitude. Or some will misrepresent your intentions, they'll say you think you're the only one going to heaven, or you're holier than thou, since when did you get so religious? Your enemies don't always play fair. Satan certainly doesn't. Satan, there's no Christmas, you know what I mean, for Satan to work. You know, we say, well, come on, it's Christmas, you know, let's have peace, it's Christmas. Not with Satan. There's no Christmas. There's no, oh, well, I'm not feeling well today, that's too bad. The battle rages on, whether you feel well or not. Another lesson, if you can't work or move forward, wait patiently on the Lord. There's a big difference between waiting and quitting. It's not the same. Waiting on the Lord isn't quitting. After all, it's God's process, not yours. He controls the timing. Therefore, there's always some waiting involved, always. If it were up to you to reach your goal, you just go step one, two, three, four, five, up to 10 and I'm there, you know. But uh, yeah, it doesn't work that way. Sometimes God you know, reveals to you in one way or another, just step number one. All you see is step one and step 10. And he invites you to take step one by faith, not knowing what step two is. That's where the waiting takes place. You take step one and then you wait. Waiting on the Lord, it's a spiritual discipline. It's very, very difficult, but it's part of growing as a, a spiritual man, spiritual woman. Lesson number four, God is always working even if you're not. I like the idea that God is working on me even when I'm asleep. God is blessing me even when I'm asleep. 
my heart's beating, my, 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 you know, I'm breathing. He's keeping, you know, the environment, uh, you know, suitable so that I can be alive. He's working even when, when I'm not. You know, the Jews, they had 20 years of downtime in the process. God was preparing them to learn a very great lesson during those 20 years. As a result of God's work, when Haggai, the prophet, began to preach to them after 20 years, they were ready to respond in two short weeks. He preached for two weeks and they were, they were back at it two weeks later. Unlike Jeremiah, who preached to the nation for decades, and nobody paid attention to him. Lesson number five, God can provide and does provide for you no matter where you are in the process. God can provide. The problem with us is we think we have to provide. Our, our part is the believing part, we believe. When I'm worried, when I'm afraid, I think be anxious for nothing. My part is be anxious for nothing. His part is taking care of the thing that's making me anxious. We forget what our part, what our, what our part is. He is just as interested in the beginning as in the end and every step in between. Even when they didn't work, God provided protection and God provided care. God provides. A lot of times we doubt this idea that God provides and that's why we don't move forward. We look at our resources, we think, man, I'm never gonna make it. Look at this, I, this is just so much gas in the tank, I'll never make it. But if you're relying on the gas in your tank, you, you're not gonna go far. We're relying on the gas that he's got in the tank, so to speak. It's his power that brings us to the completion of our goals. Uh, lesson number six, a happy thought. You might die. You might die. The officials took names of those who would be first to be executed if things didn't work out. They said, give us the name, who's in charge here? Give, we're taking names. They took the names of the guys who were in charge because they were going to go to the king and, and say, these guys are breaking the rules and they, they're going against your command. And if the king went along with that, these people would be the first ones to be executed. In the same way, your service might cause your death or it might cause the death of your energy, or the death of your opportunities, or the death of your savings account, or the death of your career, or whatever it is. You might die. It's important to count the cost before you start the process. Lesson number seven. Don't be surprised that maintenance is always always, always part of the process. So many people become discouraged because their service to a perfect God is in itself not perfect. I don't know about you, but with all my heart, and with all my strength and with all my soul, I want what I do in the name of the Lord to be perfect. No smudges, no, no mistakes, but it never is. It never is. This is why God has always provided a maintenance manual for his people and his projects. It's called the Bible. For us, it's the New Testament. There's a reason why we are called a new, you know, they say to me, well, where, where, where do you go to church? And I go, the church of Christ. What kind of church is that? They ask always, what kind of church is that? And I answer, it's a New Testament church. And the next question is, well, what's a New Testament church? It's a church that follows carefully the New Testament in all the things that it teaches and does. Easy to explain, very hard to do. Understand, maintenance, always part of the process and not easy. So, if you keep the process in mind and remember some of the lessons that we've learned from Ezra and Nehemiah's experience, you'll be better able to finish 
what God has set in your hearts to build and you will build to his glory, whatever you want to do, make sure you want to do it not for your glory, but you want to do it for his glory. That's, that's the important mindset that will keep you going. Well, we haven't finished uh, Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah, but we've finished one portion of it. We'll continue next week our lesson in the, these two books. If you haven't finished reading them, I encourage you go ahead and finish reading them so you'll have the uh, information from the books themselves as we review. Thank you very much for your attention. Our class is done. Thank you.